Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Questing Behavior, where we question behaviors because, well, we're behavioral scientists and that's effectively the only thing we do in our lives, which, you know, is an aesthetic. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. You're the dummy. And today we're actually questioning the behavior of investing, and not just any type of investing, but investing like a behavioral scientist would. So prepare yourself for some serious biases when it comes to money, risk, and just, you know, making sure you don't check investing news every single hour. Like I know Sarah would when she is investing money. (laughs) You're exposed. (laughs) Yes. I mean, it may be part of the reason why I haven't invested, you know, personally yet is because I know myself and I would become a little bit obsessed. Um, but it is something that I'm very, very interested in. And, you know, even though from the outside I appear to be a behavioral scientist, I definitely don't really know anything about the behavioral science of investing. So it's definitely something on the CV that I would um, like to look into a little bit more, let's let's just say. Um, but this kind of sounds like your cup of tea, Mala. You should be at home with these topics, right? I am actually, so I always argue that I study money, right? And I do, but I study payment methods and I study how people handle their money. Um, But I'm predominantly in the, in the spending realm, I suppose. And then I know a bit about saving out of personal interest, you know, how to make people save more. I'm not that at home in investing at all. I know how to calculate risk on return, expected values and et cetera. But that's just because I've, I've got, you know, three economic courses as background. So I feel like most people should be able to do this or learn how to do this from a lovely tutorial on YouTube. Uh, So I think when it comes to that type of stuff, because you've got a full economics background, you should know more about this than I do. But yeah, I'm I'm actually quite understocked. I feel like I, I know less about this than I should because I know how important it is. Yeah. No, no, that's interesting. I mean, my sort of knowledge of economics and investment really just stems from undergraduate macro models, you know, where we just assume that everything that we have is either consumed, like spent on consumption, or it's spent on savings. And in the models, whatever, savings equals investment, right? This idea that if you're saving money, you're automatically investing it. But I guess this isn't really necessarily true, especially in today's it's world. It's even where, smart. <laughs> well, the, the interest rate is so low. I mean, it just seems like your money is sat there not doing anything particularly. Yeah, but what if I need it? <laughs> yeah, so, th- so that, that's the sort of thing, right? You need to have enough money. You need to be liquid enough so that, you know, in a shock or uh, an unexpected occurrence that you could pay up front, you know, however much you'd need. Or if you know that, you know, you're going to be going to the job market in 18 months and potentially mm-hmm. there might be lots of upfront costs with flyouts yeah. and stuff, making sure you're saving up a pot of money that you can access for these things. But once you reach that threshold, you know, of you you have uh, enough money in the bank that's easily accessible, the question is what do you do with uh, whatever's left. I mean, I am not in that situation. I definitely do not have enough money. <laughs> I'm just going to run up to a casino. Can you imagine me running up to a casino? Um, I can For the audience, no, you can't. <laughs> to put it in perspective for the audience, I am one of the most risk averse people you'll ever meet. Um, I don't take risks. I don't like risks. Uh, I think if it's like less than a 75% uh, chance of something occurring, I'm not even betting on it. Um, it's it's not my thing. I'm I'm very risk averse. So me running to a casino where the house always wins, hell no. But I yep. do actually I do have investments. But that's thanks to my dad because he actually knows a lot about it. I uh, like I said, I'm I'm quite clueless. Yeah, and I think that's also that's also the thing. I don't think I would invest unless I got advice from someone who yeah. I knew, you know, has the sort of the knowledge to give me good advice. So okay. yeah, yeah. But so maybe our guest could be that person. I don't think we should ask Greg to just randomly invest our money. Although I'm sure he wouldn't do it randomly, but I don't think he's, uh, I don't think he takes on clients like that. (laughs) Or I mean, he might, to be honest, but I I think we should leave him alone. Okay. 
But yeah, as we've mentioned, our uh, interviewee today, our, uh, our behavioral finance expert is Greg Davis. Uh, he works at Oxford Risk. He's actually a very well-known behavioral scientist when it comes to uh, finance or behavioral finance, if you will. Uh, so we're very excited to ask him our very basic questions I would have to argue on investing because we are, as you've probably realized by this stage, um, complete rookies. So uh, yeah, let's hear it from Greg, who actually knows what he's talking about. And today we're actually talking to Greg Davies. And as you know, we don't tend to introduce our own interviewees. We let them do that themselves. So Greg, would you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Greg Davis. I, I suppose, specialize in, in behavioral finance uh, on the behavioral side. I, uh, I run part run a, an organization called Oxford Risk. We um, are, a, I guess, a fintech company that specializes in building software, decision support tools. So we create decision prosthetics that combine behavioral science together with more traditional finance theory and quantitative finance techniques uh, in the pursuit of helping people make better financial decisions. So um, you've already mentioned this, but you're actually uh, very heavily vested in behavioral finance. But how did you actually get into behavioral finance? Um, well, like most interesting things, I guess, partly by accident. So I started life as a, a very traditional economist uh, with a specialty in, in sort of finance theory. I spent a few years uh, consulting to the finance industry, doing geeky risk-based stuff, uh, and then decided that I needed to get back to academia and uh, try and do a PhD. Um, my specialty up to that point had really been a, a mix of economics and philosophy. So I was fascinated by the philosophy of rationality and these notions of rationality that underpin classical microeconomic theory. And I thought, well, I, I, I'm actually going to do something uh, entirely self-indulgent and go and do my PhD in something as far from anything practical as possible. I'm going to go deep into mm -hmm. climb the ivory tower and specialize in academic philosophy. <laughs> And while I started reading around the topic to create my um, PhD proposal uh, in this philosophy of rationality, I stumbled across the field of behavioral economics and behavioral finance. It struck me as being such a wonderful combination of the things I was already interested in, economics, decision-making, rationality, philosophy, but also bringing in psychology and being slightly less ivory tower because it had practical applications and looked at how, how people actually make decisions as opposed to how economics economists and philosophers assume that they should make decisions. So I mm -hmm. instantly sort of pivoted my PhD proposal much more to be around behavioral economics and behavioral finance uh, and away from philosophy. And I confess at the time it really wasn't intended as a career move. I, I sort of thought I would either become an academic or maybe go back to consultancy. Um, and the year after I started my PhD, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for economics. Mm -hmm. And suddenly this field that when I had started, I was in an economics faculty, was genuinely considered to be the lunatic fringe of the economics faculty. <laughs> um, nice. Suddenly got this real... A veneer of respectability to it and people started taking the behavioral economics uh, very seriously it started finding its way out of academia into the commercial world and next thing i know 20 years later i'm um, still involved in it wow so you are sort of a hipster of behavioral science <laughs> sort of you were involved just before it became before cool, it was right? cool which i would love to mm. claim was prescient and knowledgeable and insightful in some way but actually it was just complete accident no, but if someone asks, you can still claim that. Like, you don't have to tell them the truth. <laughs> Market yourself well. So we've mentioned behavioral finance. We've mentioned behavioral economics. And I think most people have realized by this stage that this podcast is grounded in behavioral science. Now, it might be quite useful uh, for the audience if you would mind explaining what behavioral finance actually is and how it is different from uh, behavioral economics and behavioral well, science. I think about behavioral finance as simply being behavioral economics and behavioral science as applied specifically to financial decision-making. So very much the same 
conceptual foundations, um, but often with a narrower set of decisions. You're typically talking about mm -hmm. decisions that involve money. Uh, this has uh, often afforded researchers with a, a very good uh, pool to study from because money, unlike many things we make decisions on, uh, is a unit of measure and enables us to mm -hmm. quanti quantify things more, more simply. So there are some aspects of behavioral finance that are um, around a subset of decisions that we might make. And there are some areas where behavioral finance has perhaps pushed things a little bit further than uh, the broader behavioral economics because it's dealing with something that is more easily quantifiable and, and, and measurable. Mm, yeah. And I guess, I mean, you could argue that sort of money touches many, many different aspects of people's lives. So I guess within that huge subset, are there any specific uh, interactions or behaviors that you are particularly interested in when it comes to behavioral finance? Well, I have focused a lot through the last 10, 15 years of my career on investment decisions uh, in particular. So how people make uh, financial decisions when faced with a trade-off involving risk and uncertainty. And I think that's a particularly mm -hmm. you know, interesting and, and fruitful area. I, I did my PhD specifically in aspects of the psychology of risk and how people, how we can quantitatively model perceptions of risk and attitudes to risk and, and risky decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so it has a, a deep academic interest. Um, it also happens commercially that um, at least until quite recently, that was one of the areas where it was possibly easiest to apply behavioral ideas in a practical way and easiest to find commercial avenues that would be valuable um, to do that. So partly it's, it's, it's an area that I think is, 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 is deeply interesting in one way or another. Partly it's, it's one that's practically uh, feasible to do things that are effective. Amazing. Um, like you said, you, your main interest is predominantly uh, in investing. Are there some some really just dead wrongs or like the the worst possible type of behaviors when it comes to investing? Like, what what would you, as an expert, most definitely discourage people from doing? What is the worst mistake? So I think there are really only three rules to for most of us for good investing. Um, one. Okay. Put your wealth to work. Don't leave it sitting under the mattress. You don't get any good investment returns by leaving it doing nothing. Um, two, diversify. Don't put it all in one thing. And three, mm -hmm. leave it alone um, because people okay. dabble. Mm -hmm. Now, it's difficult to say which of those three is more important. But suffice it to say that humans psychologically um, find it very difficult to uh, stick with each of those three very simple things. So okay. I've, for most investors, most of the time, the biggest behavioral cost is probably the cost of not investing at all. The fact that many okay. people save money uh, and they save it uh, in such a way as they, you know, I've saved money that I don't need for the next five and 10 years, and then they do nothing with it. They leave that money sitting in a bank account, earning very low rates of interest. And so that's for most people, the most reliable behavioral cost. So people do that partly because it's complex figuring out what to do and we dislike complexity and we shy away from it. Um, they will do it partly because uh, it's one of these problems that has you know, short-term effort and short-term pain associated with long-term outcomes and long-term gains. So the tyranny of the present, we, um, we, we, we do what feels comfortable in the moment, not what's right for our long-term needs. Um, and, um, and partly because taking money from somewhere safe, uh, a savings account and putting it somewhere risky in, in, into investments in the short term is an emotionally uncomfortable thing to do. And as humans, sure. we pursue mm -hmm. emotional comfort and it costs us, uh, we pursue it at the cost of good decisions. And so for all of these reasons, most people underinvest for the money that they have saved. And that adds up if you think about, if you think about a standard moderate risk, multi-asset class portfolio. So a simple portfolio, not trying to do anything too clever or shoot the lights out. Mm -hmm. Over the long term, you'd probably expect to earn over and above what you would get from a bank account around 4 to 5% per year on average. So sure. if you fail to put your money to work, you're effectively buying yourself the ability to sleep better at night because it's the comfortable thing to do <laughs> at the cost of 4, right. 4 to 5% compounded per year. 
and that adds up to an awful lot of money um, over time. So that I think is the is the is the biggest hurdle. Um, the other one, once people are invested, is the leave it alone. We really, really don't like to think that things are out of our control, and and so sure. we make up stories and narratives about how much we know about the the world out there and how much we are able against all evidence to predict the ups and downs of the stock market. And that leads sure. to confirmation bias and it leads to overconfidence. And that means that mm -hmm. people overtrade. They do too much. There's an action bias. And if you think about investing as essentially playing, uh, playing a bunch of lotteries where your opponent is the universe, um, what people mm -hmm. do when they overtrade is they place far too many marginal bets where the probabilities are far too narrow. And because of all these biases and overconfidence, et cetera, not only are you placing more bets than you should, but you're playing with the wrong probabilities. So the universe is always going to win uh, unless you unless you try mm. to overcome these emotional biases. The universe sounds a bit like a casino. <laughs> How yeah. it always wins. <laughs> well, the interesting thing in investing is, is that is true, except it's the opposite. So oh. in a casino, if you play, you are betting against the house. The house has the odds in their mm -hmm. favor. And over time, the house will win and you will lose. In investing, sure. this is true. I mean, most investments are uh, at least as unpredictable and as random as, as, as a casino. The difference is in investing, it's if you don't play that you're playing, betting against the house. Because if you put to your money to work in the economy and you can afford to leave it for long periods of time, you get rewarded for putting your money to productive use. Uh, an economist would say there is a risk premium. So in investing, it's actually not playing where you're betting against the house. In being invested, you're playing with the house and you should be able to benefit from that. Okay, so that's a very interesting yeah. way of putting it. I've never thought of it like that. That's very interesting. So would you say that everyone who currently at the moment, you know, has a savings account that, that they're planning on not touching for the next 10 to 15, 20 years, that they should be looking at trying to invest that money and not leaving it uh, uh, in, in a bank, not earning very much interest? Is that is that really the Absolutely. goal? Absolutely. Uh, right. Well, no, I mean, the goal is to uh, increase your wealth over the long term relative to the risk you're prepared to take and relative to the stress, discomfort and anxiety you're willing to, 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 to sit through in, on the way there. So the goals are what you can do with that at the end. Um, I mean, another goal from investing is, uh, is, is, is not just growing your wealth, it's increasing your resilience. So we've all entered COVID-19 world right now. And we know that many, many people uh, are not very financially resilient. Many households in the UK and the US around the world are not very financially resilient. And, you know, the ways that you get yourself financially resilient over time is that you increase your savings behavior. And once you've got that wealth, and if you've got the time horizon to do it, you grow that wealth in order to, to effectively buy yourself the ability to withstand shocks now, we can withstand certain shocks in a very targeted way by buying insurance, but investing is a way of building up your financial resilience over time um, by, by getting into the markets and, and getting that risk premium. Now, so should someone who has money in their savings account that they are not going to use, that they don't, that they're fairly clear they don't, they're not going to uh, need under five years, should they be putting that into investments? Absolutely. It's, it's, the, it's the only logical thing for them to do. Two things are very important to realize, though, that one is um, financial liquidity matters a lot. So mm -hmm. if it is money that you are perhaps going to need to draw in the short term, in the next 12 months, two years, three years, etc., then you need to be much more cautious about that. Because what you absolutely don't want is to put money into the investment markets to find that the markets drop, as they have recently, and you are forced to withdraw at a time not of your choosing. So financial liquidity is vitally important. And uh, John Maynard Keynes said, uh, well, actually, it's, it's one of these quotes that um, he probably didn't say, but it's a tribute to him. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, markets can stay irrational for longer than you can stay solvent. I have heard that quote. Well, what, what, what he meant, if he had indeed said it, 
um, was that <laughs> you want to make sure you could have the best portfolio in the world, but if you are forced to sell at a time not of your choosing because you need the money and the markets are down, mm -hmm. you can know that your portfolio is going, going to go back up. But if you don't have a choice, you've got to sell. You have failed as an investor because you have run out of financial liquidity. So safety first is an absolute principle. First, figure out what you need to set aside to cover your spending. We should have a, a savings buffer that covers X months of spending. Money that you know you're going to need to draw in the next two or three years, that needs to be in something relatively safe. But anything over about five years, absolutely that should be in the markets. The other thing that we need to do is most people who sell in a panic at the bottom of a financial crisis who who go i need i i can't stand this anymore they there are people who withdraw their money who pull their money out of the markets because they needed to maintain their lifestyle because they they've lost a job or something so in some cases it is about financial liquidity but mostly people sell at the bottom of a market not because they've run out of financial liquidity but because they have run out of emotional liquidity their reservoir of emotional reserves has run dry and they go I'm too stressed. I just can't handle this anymore. And this for me is an interesting distinction between classical finance and behavioral finance. So the classical finance position to that would be, well, we told you not to sell at the bottom. It's stupid. It's irrational. Don't do it. I would say from a behavioral perspective, there is absolutely nothing irrational about selling at the bottom of the market because not everything is measured in in pounds. Absolutely. So if I sell at the bottom of the market, I'm buying something very real in return. I'm buying relief. I'm buying the ability to draw a line under further future losses. I'm buying the ability mm -hmm. to sleep at night. I'm buying the ability to get on with my life. So the question is not, is it rational or irrational? The question is, how expensive is it? Are you spending too much money <laughs> on your emotional comfort? Because if you have lost a lot of money down on the way down as markets go down and then you sell at the bottom and you lock in that loss, it may not be irrational, but it's phenomenally expensive. There have to be cheaper ways of purchasing the emotional comfort that you need. Hmm. Do you have suggestions? Yeah. I feel like you have suggestions <laughs> for me to get more. Now, I'm, I'm actually, most people don't realize this about me, but I'm a very risk averse person. So when it comes to investing, I'm... I, I have invested, I feel good about having done it. And I know Sarah is very keen on getting into the market, but I'm I'm pretty sure Sarah is also quite risk averse. <laughs> so I think when markets go down, we're just looking at our money and going like, oh no, oh no. Yeah. Like so is this is this desire to buy emotional comfort, is that actually tied in with risk attitude? Do more risk averse people um are they unable to withstand such big drops in the market? Oh, okay. So we get quite quickly into a, a, a naughty, um, a naughty problem, which is <laughs> what do we mean by risk attitude? And I risk see. attitudes are multi-dimensional things. So if we talk about someone's sure. risk attitude, there's one distinction that makes that is extremely important at this point. One aspect of my risk attitude is my long-term willingness to trade off risk in return, and we mm -hmm. can measure that as a trait, as a psychometric trait, and it's pretty stable, uh, and it's pretty stable through your life. And it tells me when I pitch myself a long time into the future, and I think about um, the potential of my portfolio being lower versus higher, to what degree am I prepared to take that gamble? A completely distinct thing is what we might call composure uh, or the, the risk attitude of your in-the-moment context-dependent feelings. Sure. So there are people who have very high long-term risk tolerance, willingness to trade off risk and return of distant outcomes, but who become extremely anxious over the journey. They have a higher tendency towards emotional engagement with the here and now. And so when the markets drop, you're very often not talking about someone's risk tolerance. You're talking about their degree of, of composure, their degree, their willingness or their ability to withstand the stress of the, of the short-term ups and downs. And that distinction is one that yeah, I think is, is, is reasonably clear, but unfortunately mm -hmm. 
is not one that finds its way into a lot of classical finance theory, doesn't find its way into a lot of how the industry in general, the financial services industry approaches this problem. So we really need to think, um, you may be risk averse in the sense that you are reluctant in any given moment to take risk because your mm -hmm. emotional self is taking a short-term time horizon view of it. But if I was to give you a gamble and say, well, why don't you take this gamble where the consequences are going to happen in five years' time, you could simultaneously be quite willing to do that. And so it's, a, it's an aspect of time preference mixed with risk attitudes that uh, is actually quite important to disentangle when looking at people's uh, behavioral responses to investing. Mm, yeah. All right. I mean, it's an incredibly interesting uh, thought exercise as well to think about, you know, what other aspects of people's attitudes are going to be impacting their beliefs and their actions. So, I mean, just thinking about it off the cuff, you know, regret aversion or loss aversion, you know, how strongly they feel losses is going to impact the decisions in the market. Uh, and it's not just decisions when you're in the investment market. It, it's also the decision to enter the investment mm. market. I mean, do you find that um, of the people that choose to enter into the investment market, that they all have sort of relatively similar preferences? Or is there still quite a large heterogeneity within that population? Um, th there's, a, there's a very large heterogeneity. I think it's a bit like, um, is, it, is it Tolstoy? You know, all happy families are happy in the same way and all unhappy families are, are, are uniquely unhappy. So it's yeah, it's, it's the start of uh, Anna Karenina, I think. That's that's right. Uh, uh, yes, you're right. Um, and so the um, if I if I focus on someone's long term willingness to try, take risk, there are a myriad of different things that could intervene to make me uncomfortable with that right answer. In fact, in, in my view, we can view almost all decision making through a very simple lens, which is there is a disconnect between the sensible thing to do and the emotionally comfortable thing to do in any given moment. And as humans, mm -hmm. we deviate towards the emotionally comfortable thing to do. And that's not, as I said earlier, that's not irrational. It's perfectly, we, we all have a, we're all perfectly justified in wanting to be emotionally comfortable through our lives. The question is whether you are doing so in a way that is more expensive when you could do that in a way that, that is cheaper. But, if you could identify the perfect long-term investment portfolio for someone, the right thing to do in, a long, in the long term in financial decision making is almost always uncomfortable in some way or another in the short term. But it can be uncomfortable in very different ways for different people. So someone, for example, who is a low composure individual is discomforted because they have a, a, an emotional focus on the short term. They feel the ups and downs in the road. They find it difficult to keep their eye on the long-term goal, and they're constantly deviating from that. We could also think about things like familiarity preferences. Some people are uncomfortable with a diversified long-term portfolio because diversification by its very nature means putting into that a whole lot of things that are unfamiliar to you, a whole lot of things for, whom, for which you don't have an individually resonant, resonant narrative or story. So people who uh, score high on a familiarity bias, for example, they will feel uncomfortable with that portfolio, not for um, time horizon reasons, but for familiarity reasons. Uh, in the tools that we build to measure uh, financial personality, we can measure now off the shelf about 15 different dimensions of financial personality. Oh. And each of those, with the exception of risk tolerance, which almost tells me what's the right star to steer by, what's the, the long-term right thing to do, every one of the others tells me something about what is specifically likely to make you emotionally uncomfortable with the right answer. And once I know at an individual level that your particular pattern is high this, low that, medium that, et cetera, we can start to figure out how do I get for you the emotional comfort that you need to withstand the journey in the most planned, cheap, and efficient way possible, rather than leaving it up to you and you doing it yourself in an emotionally driven, knee-jerk, um, haphazard way? 
So is, is that the goal of risk profiling to get someone through the market, the stock market or any type of investment process with the least emotional damage, if I may phrase it that way? Yeah, I do. Two comments to that. Um, uh, classical finance theory tells us that what you should do is you should optimize your expected utility. And your expected utility is typically defined or can, can be defined in terms of a risk return trade-off. So what you should be doing is maximizing your risk-adjusted returns. You want to get the maximum amount of returns for the minimum amount of risk. Now, when you come to real people, that's largely nonsense because mm -hmm. we get into all these complicated discussions about what we mean by risk and how you measure it. The fact is what most people want is not risk-adjusted returns. They want the best possible returns they can get relative to the stress, discomfort, and anxiety they're going to have to endure along the journey. So what people really want to maximize is anxiety-adjusted returns. And mm. here's the interesting thing. Anxiety and risk are correlated. So I can reduce your anxiety by putting you in a lower risk portfolio. I make you less anxious and I dial down the risk. But by putting you in a lower risk portfolio, I am also uh, reducing your expected returns. So trying to reduce anxiety only by reducing risk is actually a very expensive way of doing it. What I should instead be doing is going, well, let me try and keep your risk level high so that you can get high returns. And I'm going to, instead of reducing your anxiety by changing your portfolio, I'm going to be doing it by communicating to you better. I'm going to be doing it by holding your hand in times of market downturns because I know your financial personality and I know which specific messages are likely to resonate with you. So we can do an awful lot to improve anxiety-adjusted returns by communication and engagement and relationship management that doesn't require us delving into the traditional finance toolkit and bringing out all sorts of complex portfolio optimization techniques. So what type of uh, of comfort am I thinking of then? Because now, now I'm quite curious, Greg. Like, what, what are you doing to the people, for the people? Uh, so, oh, there was one other thing I just wanted to comment on that, um, which is uh, risk profiling you mentioned. So mm -hmm. risk profiling is a term in financial services industry, which typically means I want to measure your risk tolerance. Um, and if we measure that right, we get this nice stable star to steer by. Um, it is a very small part of what we should be doing. So if you genuinely want to get okay. people to good outcomes, identifying the right thing for them to do is only a small part of it. I have to make you comfortable with that. Otherwise, you are going to shoot yourself in the foot by reacting in a stressed way as we, as we go along. So we much prefer to think about uh, profiling in terms of financial personality profiling rather than just, just risk profiling. But what will come from that? So... Um, if I have, if you've been through a, a profiling tool and we know something reliable and stable about your financial personality relative to other people out there, and this doesn't have to be spuriously precise. I simply need to know in the, relative to the baseline population, are you high, medium, or low on these six different things? Sure. Once I know that, we can, firstly, we can say maybe in your case, we want to give you a slightly different portfolio. There might be there might be tweaks you would make to the risk level, etc. But mostly what I want to do is I want to go, how should I control the information reaching you? Are you someone who is very likely to get bogged down in the weeds of short-term and highly detailed information if we send it to you in that format? In which case, our job is actually to make sure that we control the narrative of how you're doing in an investment context so that you the first thing you see is not the performance over the last day of the 50 things you hold. The first thing you see is the aggregate performance of the entire portfolio over the last three years. Now, you could have exactly the same portfolio, but if you cut that information differently, you're going to induce a different emotional response in that person. And so by sure. controlling information without changing anything about the investment, you can improve people's uh, decision-making, their emotional state, their comfort, their, um, their client satisfaction. Um, there are other things we might do. So um, classical finance theory, for example, tells us that phased investment is 
wrong. It's the irrational thing to do. And by phased investment, okay. I mean, if you have a pool of cash sitting on the side, um, mm -hmm. you could either put it all in. As many of as, us do. As many of us, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> But imagine you did, right? And, and you could either put that all into the markets at once, which would be technically mm -hmm. the right thing to do, because on a risk return basis, you, know, you're, you, you want to get it invested. The mm -hmm. trouble is doing that makes most people very emotionally uncomfortable and some people more than others. So phased investment is you go, I'm sort of diversifying my anxiety over time. I'm not, I'm not loading my potential for regret and anxiety all on this one moment where I'm going to put the money into the market and run the risk of probably I'll be okay, but if I get it wrong, I'm really going to regret doing that. So instead what you do is you divide your pool of money into five equal portions and one every once every month or every quarter of the next five months, you put your portion in. So this is like, um, you know, the uh, Bernard C. and Thaler's save more tomorrow, but it's an invest more tomorrow, yeah. right? I'm, I'm, I'm sure. using a systematized program of future investment that removes the decision making from my future stressed self and gives it to my current calm self. And by doing that, I put a chunk of money in every month for the next five months. Classical finance tells me that that is, um, that is inefficient. In a risk return basis, it's the wrong thing to do. It's irrational. But here's the thing. Relative to the alternative of being too nervous to get that money invested at all, the very small costs, the very small efficiency costs of dribbling it in over five months relative to... I just can't bring myself to make that decision. And so I sit on this money for the next 10 years. Actually, what you're doing by doing this thing that classical finance tells you is wrong, it's a very clever way of buying yourself emotional comfort to, to get closer to the right answer. And an awful lot of this is going, how do I not let the best be the enemy of the good? Forget about the optimization of classical finance theory. I want to satisfy. I want something that is close enough to good but that is also sufficiently comfortable for me to enact and for me to stick with. And what we're looking for is tools and techniques that can help us to get as much comfort as possible with as minimal deviation from the technically correct answer as possible. I see. So now that you've mentioned phase investment, it actually makes me think of something else. There, there's a, a whole bunch of apps which allow you to put very small amounts of money on, I think, almost a daily basis or maybe even an hourly basis into the market as a way of investing. I think the, the apps are grounded in the fact that they want you to get into the habit of investing, you know, whilst not having a massive chunk of capital up front. Is this something that you are then a proponent of or is this something that you're not that impressed by? Uh, no, I think I think those are good um, uh, for two reasons. Um, wh one is, as you say, it gives people comfort and familiarity with the notion of investing. And very often, the biggest hurdle is the first hurdle. It's it's getting someone from you know zero to step one. And so, if you can use those approaches to make people more comfortable with investing with small amounts, then then that is potentially a very good thing. Um, secondly, it, it's a way of allowing people to commit money uh, sequentially as they earn it and to to set, to go directly from savings to investing. And once you do that, it actually puts certain psychological barriers or sort of semi-permeable mental accounts that mean that you're more likely to keep it there. So it's, 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 it's a psychologically bigger step to pull money out of an investment account where you have to sell something than to pull money out of a savings account where it's already in cash. So it helps to encourage savings behavior as well. Um, it should be said that that's slightly different from phased investing. So there is a distinction between okay. phased investing when I've got cash sitting there doing nothing versus uh, investing in small amounts as I earn the cash. So ideally, you first get yourself up to the point where you're not sitting with surplus cash if you're in the lucky position that you are. <laughs> and after that, mm -hmm. you invest consistently as you do it. And the other thing about those systems that is vitally important for most financial behavior is it helps you to automate good behavior. So in order to be a less emotional decision maker, what most of us should be striving to do is wherever possible, I want to take decisions away from my emotionally charged future self who I can't trust and give the decisions to mm -hmm. me now where I, am, I have the time and space to sit and think in a cool, calm and collected way 
And we should be trying to figure out ways of trying to program our future selves and take decisions away from our future selves and ideally automate them entirely so that we are not, we do not find ourselves in the position of having to make from scratch a decision every month through the rest of our lives because we make a decision once and it is enacted for us automatically through the rest of our lives. Yeah. So this is very much within sort of the behavioral insights frameworks of just making behaviors easier, uh, more automatic. It means that they're more likely to happen. Is 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 that right? Yeah, Am I yeah absolutely. That? Although I think you know a lot of decisions being making them easier. You know, one of my issues with at least one interpretation of the whole nudge area is um, it tends to fi- focus on um, isolated decision nodes, decisions at a single point in time. And it's about making that that easier. Um, actually, when you, when this, what I'm talking about is you, you almost want that first decision to be harder because you want it to be thoughtful. You want it to be engaged. This is not about sure. nudging people into things that are good for them with, well, whilst they're not noticing. It's mm-hmm. about trying to get them to be engaged and complicit and, uh, and uh, involved in the design of a decision structure that will mean that they simply do not have to make future decisions at all because they've made one up front now. I do think I would like to be engaged or at least aware if, you know, money is cycling out of my bank account yes. into the stock market. <laughs> that would be nice. I think I'd like to be notified. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is, this is, I think, a huge problem for the way our entire financial services industry is set up because okay. it is set up to sell products. Savings accounts, current accounts, investment accounts, little containers that you put stuff in. Now, yeah. the, the problem is that it places a huge burden on the consumer, on the decision maker, on the, on the, on the end individual uh, in terms of maintaining uh, those, that system of accounts and uh, on building it in the first place. So most of us, even if we you know, work in financial services, even if we know what we're doing to some degree, we have been expected to cobble together our own rickety financial system through the course of our lives. So, you know, you get your current account when you go to university for the first time and you get it because it was the, you know, the bank that was giving you the biggest cash incentive to go and open the account there. And then some point later, you, you know, you get a savings account somewhere and you cobble on a mortgage later. And there's absolutely no reason to believe that any of us have gathered over time this sort of sequential agglomeration of bits and pieces in a way that makes sense, in a way that is in any way structured sensibly. And because it's rickety and it's been sort of cobbled together over time, it takes an awful lot of maintenance to keep it going. So we all as individuals have to do all of the hard work every month to go, well, I've got, I've managed to save something this month. Where do I put it? Do I put it in the savings account? Do I put it into my ISA? Do I put money into my pension account? Do I pay back my brother-in-law because I borrowed money from him? Do I... Uh, (laughs) Even the simplest decision has so many options. It's fiendishly complicated. And what most of us do when we're faced with dauntingly complex decisions is we ignore them and we sidestep them and we leave them for next month. And so this money doesn't go anywhere. Instead, it sits in the current account. And because it's there, we get tempted to use it and goes out again. So as an industry, we need to do a lot more not to design products and containers and pots. We need to design systems that, are, that, that work better for people as a whole. And then we need to enable people to build rules that flow things through these systems in a way that makes sense given their, their, unique, uh, their unique picture. So if we do that, we help people to gradually um, calibrate their own financial system in a way that it starts to work for them in the background and reduces that week-by-week, month-by-month burden of decision making that is not only time consuming but immensely emotionally uh, draining as well. So we've mentioned uh, technology and data quite a, a few times now. How do you think both technology and the availability of data is going to help the the finance sector or behavioral side of behavioral finance as a field of study? Are you having high hopes for it? Oh, absolutely. Um, so you know we are an organization that focuses very heavily on now uh, taking a mix of behavioral science and finance and investing theory and financial well-being and baking that into software and technology. Um, 
one of the things that we are doing with a client in Singapore is um, developing what you might think of as a, um, a digital nudge engine. Um, so a effectively a digital client relationship tool that based mm-hmm. on a knowledge of your financial personality, what your what you've got in your in your financial system, what you've got in your various pots and accounts, um, looking at your mm-hmm. ongoing on, ongoing transactional behavior, is able to constantly surface to you a unique set of hyper personalized nudges, prompts, communications, next best actions, etc., such that you are building a guidance system to help simplify the complexity in people's financial lives. Now that can only be done in two ways. One is a very knowledgeable, knowledgeable, highly trained financial advisor who is extremely expensive to deploy and can't be done Mm -hmm. at scale, or you use data science, digital technology, design and behavioral science to bake that into into an engine. So I I think that very much the world is going in, in that direction. And there are things that we'll see in the next five to 10 years that really start to unify people's um, finances in a way that finally they go, oh, I see how it fits together. I know what to do next. I know the complexity is there, but I also know that I don't have to worry about all of the complexity of all the possible things I could do right now. And what you want people to do is to start chipping away at the important things in their finances one by one. Um, What we tend to do as an industry and go is go, here's the complex optimal thing for you to do. And either do it or don't do it. And many people, as a result, don't do it. I see. Mm. I had a a question about um, these sort of behavioral finance profiling tools you referred to earlier. The type of person that invests, there is a bit of a a stereotype. Um, And I know that there are lots of initiatives to try and get, for example, more women into investing and being comfortable to invest their money and enter into investment markets. And I'm wondering whether or not these behavioral profiling tools could offer um, a potential way to make the investment market uh, more accessible uh, and equal. I'm not sure if you have no. much experience with that. So I, it, it rather depends what you mean by a, a profile. Um, so our standard tools will focus very much on measuring psychometric traits. And those are you know, one aspect of a profile. And there we believe it's important to understand the individual as an individual and not uh, try to um, not try to use demographics as a blunt tool to measure something that is quite precise. And so as an example of that, we may know that in two populations, uh, one has slightly higher risk tolerance than the other, for example. But what we typically find is in each of those populations, the diversity within the population completely dwarfs average differences between them. So it is very, very important to focus on the individual rather than the demographic characteristics of that individual. That said, if I really want to profile someone well, it's not just the psychometric traits that are important. Their demographics are part of the broader profile. And absolutely, that needs to be to be used to um, to uh, to sharpen the solutions that are put in front of people. Where I think this is important, though, is the the notion that men and women are different and therefore should have different investment solutions, I think, is entirely wrong. And there are many, I mean, many attempts to sort of, you know, create the the financial services company for women and the one for men, and and they typically don't work. And part of the reason for that is, is the dispersion on any one trait across men and women is very, very broad, and the individual is important. But what you could do is you could take a pool of people on whom you have a very rich profile on many dimensions, and you could run over the top of this a cluster analysis of some sort to identify subgroups of people that share similar characteristics. And you might use both personality traits and demographics in that. But let's imagine you used only personality traits. So I've, I've measured these personality traits, and I'm looking for pools of people who have common sets of of personality features. Now, here I, at this point, have not applied a gender lens whatsoever. But what I would find, typically, is that although I'm not at any point designing something for men or for women, I now have a series of clusters 
which have common personality traits, and some of those might be more male and some of those might be more female. So it becomes sure. an oblique way of actually in a, in, in a more palatable way of designing something for a pool of people with common features that just so happens to simultaneously address some of what often looks like a very blunt gender lens, but in fact, the gender lens is way too, ble- way too blunt to be useful. Mm. I mean, sometimes it's even at that designing phase uh, where people are sort of uh, unconsciously biasing the tool towards working better for one type of person than another. So for example, the choice of what indicators or psychometric properties to use in order to profile someone and trying to figure out, okay, what's important for this person, you know, that could be based potentially on evidence largely done by men on men for men, for example. So, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Rather than focusing on looking at groups and demographics and trying to, um, put people in these boxes and say, everyone within that one box is going to be very, very similar. Um, I'm, I wonder whether or not there would be differences in the way that we design tools potentially. Yeah, so, I mean, the implication here is that, that you're not tailoring advice for women or for men. You're, you're tailoring advice for a certain set of, of, of measurable characteristics. Some of, some of, and you, so you might design you know, here are, here's a, a proposition I've designed for each of five different identifiable pools of people. And some of those will more naturally speak more to men than to women or more to some men than, than to some women. So your proportions are different. So I think, I think that's important. When we build our psychometric tools, we deliberately use representative, independently gathered data sets of thousands of people. Um, we let the the data and the analytic techniques build the tools for us. So we're not going, oh, that sounds like a nice question. Let me put it here. It's all very important sure. and data-driven. And then once the tool is built, we then go and say, now are there observed differences in subpopulations and cultures in, in men and women in old versus young people? And sometimes there are, but typically the, the differences in those subpopulations are very much more muted than, than the differences within each of those populations. I'm actually quite curious. So, I mean, as you said, the tool is based on the data you've had now, the technology that you have available to you now. So ideally, say that, you know, because technology grows exponentially anyway, and the data is becoming increasingly more forthcoming. Where would you like to see this in 10 years? What would you be able to do for a behavioral finance perspective? So for me, I think it is less about enhancing the profiling tools and more okay. about what we do with them. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the profiling tools, we can already, with a very small number of questions, get a pretty accurate and rich profile across multiple dimensions of someone. And there may be things that we can do to improve that. In certain things, it may be that I don't have to ask you any questions because I can infer that from some of your behavior. We need to be careful there. We very quickly start heading into Cambridge Analytica territory when you <laughs> when you go down into that world. And we we are very careful that everything we do is extremely transparent and people know when they're being profiled and they know they know that they're being asked questions. But there might be things we could do to make the profiling process a little bit quicker or easier or you know better design. Mm-hmm. Those will be marginal improvements. The big improvements sure. is once I've once I know something, once I know who you are what you've got, can observe your behavior. The raft of things I can do off the back of that is enormous. So I can use it to um, improve your portfolio. I can use it to make sure that something that the solution is structured, especially for you. I can use it to enhance communication. So when we have times of crisis and the market drops rapidly, um, who gets what message? The message that you mm-hmm. get should be the one that's most likely to make you comfortable and improve your decision making. I can use it to change the in- information flow of individuals. I can use it to understand what a good next best action is. And it's that system that comes, that follows the profiling is the important thing. The profiling itself has to be accurate. And there's uh, a sad number of profiling tools, well, as of... Um, well, snake oil masquerading as good profiling tools out there. Um, mm-hmm. but, so it has to be accurate and well validated. But the real power, I think, is coming is coming in how we're going to use that to help people in real time make better de- decisions and navigate their 
their financial uh, situation. I, I think I'm just curious in general, like what, what is your hope for the, the field of behavioral finance? Like what, what do you really want to get out of that field? How do you hope it evolves? And not even with regards to risk profiling or with regards to investing, but just, just as a from, from a more academic perspective, what would you like to see from this field? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is the direction it's heading in already, which is more focus on individual differences and less focus on average things. Uh, and that sure. also extends to the fact of uh, understanding how these things work in, you know, non-weird subject pools. What is the weird? You know, mm-hmm. we, we need to understand better how individuals behave. The one that I think for me is the most important, though, is systems thinking. Uh, an awful lot mm-hmm. of behavioral study and knowledge out of necessity is built through isolating decisions. I'm going to focus on this decision in this in this lab. I'm going to use this randomized control trial to test this particular thing over here. And actually, that those sorts of decisions are encountered so seldom in real life. Everything we do has a knock-on effect on everything else. And it's not just that the system is complex and therefore our understanding, if we don't address it from a systems perspective, is weak. It's the fact that the complexity of the system itself is an input into people's decision making. So unless we incorporate the knowledge of complexity and how people approach complexity, we're only ever, are, we're only ever building stuff that understands their decision making in small little worlds that actually even if we improve their decision-making within these bounds, how do we know that we're not having a knock-on effect on something somewhere else? So an example of this would be, it's, it's often held that you know, randomized control trials are the gold standard of behavioral interventions. Which, So I could, I could go and say, well, I'm going to build a savings account and I'm going to throw all the bells and whistles at my disposal at the savings account in order to design something that I think is going to encourage people to put more into this savings account than to this control one I've got over here. And then I'm going to test it in a randomized controlled way. And hey, presto, my savings account is better. Great. However, how do I know that the money that's gone into that savings account hasn't been pulled from somewhere else in someone's financial system and has actually made them less financially resilient somewhere else? How do I know that the design that I've done that on the surface in a randomized control trial looks like a wonderful success, isn't actually harmful to people in the bigger picture. And if everything we do in behavioral science is built around isolating things rather than understanding Mm -hmm. how to help people navigate complexity, then we're not really solving real problems. And so that for me is where I would like to see the whole thing go is much more focus on complex systems and how behavioral science interacts with complex systems. Yeah, amazing. Amazingly well put. And I hope that we see that as well, because that sounds incredibly fascinating. Thank you so much for your time today, Greg. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Absolute pleasure. Uh, if, uh, if the listener wants to hear more from you or to um, keep up with what you're doing, is there any way that they can find you um, online? Yes, Twitter's probably the best, um, at Greg B. Davis, <laughs> D-A-V-I-E-S. Um, oxfordrisk.com also if you're interested in the commercial side of what we're doing and the profiling tools we have actually recently in this COVID crisis made a uh, a market emergency survival kit version of our financial personality freely available to investors uh, that's it'll measure six different dimensions of your financial personality and give you um, pointed uh, guidance as to how you can approach your investment decision making in these sorts of times so that's that's also available on our website fantastic i will make sure to do that before the week ends because i am genuinely <laughs> curious how i would score now i've become very curious as to no because because you mentioned the um the difference between like a longer term and, and a shorter term a risk attitude or risk versus composure and now i'm actually i'm quite keen to learn about myself what i am <laughs> Okay, so that was our conversation with Greg Davis. Uh, Mala, what did you think? I thought it was a great conversation, but I uh, I have to admit again that I don't know that much about investing. So I think any information I can get on how to invest and what to watch out for is uh, 
is beneficial to me. And I've learned the difference between a long-term and a short-term risk attitude uh, or risk attitude versus composure, which I think uh, is a good lesson to learn. Yeah. Absolutely. What what I picked up on that has sort of stuck with me a little bit is this idea of rather than looking specifically at sort of risk return trade-offs, more focusing on anxiety return trade-offs. Yeah, I'm I'm actually so I know um Oxford Risk, which is where where Greg works, where he is the behavioral scientist. Uh, I know they have this tool available and because uh, they now also have this on a part of the tool is now available online. So I'm actually gonna after this episode, I'm gonna very quickly check how risk averse I am in the long term and and com- how composed I am in the short term. Um and we will we will link that tool below so you can figure it out yourself. Uh, but I'm I'm really curious to see. I'm, I think I'm a very, very risk averse person, which is exactly why I chose a career in academia where the, <laughs> you know, the return on investment is incredible, is, you know, very uh, limited <laughs> or there's a, there's a low probability of making it. Let's just put it that way. Um, but no, I've always thought I was very risk averse. And I, but I think my, my long term risk attitude is probably uh, much more risk seeking than I think. It's just I've got no composure. If I see stocks go down, I, I lose my uh, I lose my shit. I I can't deal with stress yeah. like that. I just can't. Yeah. So I'm wondering yeah. how much I would be willing to give up um, in terms of uh, return on assets uh, to actually sleep at night. Mm. No, that's really interesting. And I wonder if even with knowing this about yourself, you know, is that going to change the way you make decisions i don't know i probably still need someone to manage it for me let's be very realistic i when i think about investment because i do have uh invested um which i would recommend to anyone if you've got the the money laying aside quote end quote um i i think you're probably better off having someone manage it for you because they are not as emotionally involved and they just want to get you your best returns and, you know, when the stock market goes down, they're not panicking because they're not scared. It's their retirement fund going to waste. So, you know, I, I think, you know, have someone manage your money. Um, someone yeah. who's, who knows more about it than you do, who's less emotionally attached than you are. I think that's uh, that's mm. always a good tip. But yeah, and I, I think I think it's it's uh, a good idea to have someone managing your money also because they then can uh, decide what information they give you about how well your money's doing in the stock market. So if it was me myself, you know, I think I'd probably be checking every every day. Maybe if I see Would you really? Me. I don't know. I'd be interested. I'm sort of Yeah, yeah. Interested. <laughs> I, I get a little bit obsessive over these things if I That's if I have it. their stakes. <laughs> But I know that that every day is not a little bit obsessed. That's insane. No. Well, it's yeah. And I don't think it would lead to me feeling the best about what my money's doing because then I'd be no. so much more sensitive to shocks. You've got no composure. <laughs> you've you've got even no. less composure than I do. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think well, so. at, at least you know that about yourself, which is good. Yes. Yes. I know that I need someone to deliver information with the very much the long term picture in mind to keep myself I on see. track. Yeah. So they shouldn't send you daily updates. They should, you know, be very vague about the monthly trends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unless they want me obsessing and Googling for like hours and hours into, into, what into sort of rabbit Google? holes. Oh God, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'd be Googling. What should I be? What should I know? <laughs> what, what should I know? <laughs> Investing 101. And then, you know, you read one questionable site and you're on the phone with, you know, your financial consultant and being like, you need to pull all my stocks now. The market yeah. is going to crash. <laughs> I can just see you sitting down there with like a tin foil hat, just losing it. I'm high yeah. maintenance. Okay. <laughs> you're you know we're gonna call it, you're emotionally involved we'll just call yeah, it that's, that <laughs> that's very true i am but yeah i guess that was our episode today i had a great time i learned a lot i hope you did too uh, and yeah if you want to 
keep track of what Greg's doing. We'll link all of his stuff in the description of the podcast. Make sure you do go check out um, that tool uh, and let us know where you fall on the risk aversion scale. We'd be quite <laughs> interested to hear. <laughs> I just want to meet like a really risk seeking person. I wonder what that looks like. I don't yeah, think I know exist. that many. No. Yeah, they do exist. I thought always when you keep, um, so this is like a general number from like a BE, but I think about 75% of people is risk seeking. And then of the other what? 25, I think, not, no, sorry, sorry, risk averse. Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. Oh, I was going to yeah. say, 75 of the world is risk seeking. God knows how many gamblers and bungee jumpers there are. No, oh, sorry, 75% is risk averse. And then I think another t about 20 is risk neutral. So these are yeah. people probably with a lot of experience in what they're doing, and they're, they're quite good in calculating risk and return. Uh, expected value, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then about five percent is risk seeking. So it's very, very rare. So it's quite mm. difficult to meet these people. But like in a in a room of twenty, assuming this room is somewhat representative, you should have one. Yeah, you know, if know. you're looking at the percentages. <laughs> Let's put a poll on the on Twitter and uh, <laughs> yeah, are you risk seeking? <laughs> we'll see if our audience is a representative sample. Oh, that's such a good question. The population. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. That sounds funny. Okay. Cool. Well, cool. And this was the episode. Like Sarah said, check out Greg, check out his work, check out the Oxford Risk Tool in the description box of this podcast and let us know where you fall. Are you risk averse just like us? Are you obsessive just like Sarah? We need yep. to know. We need to know. Yes, uh, I need yeah. to know. I'm going to obsess over it now. <laughs> yes, I know you are. So yeah, this is uh, the podcast for this week. Uh, we hope it was interesting. We hope you learned something cool or at least were entertained for about an hour. And let us know on the socials what you thought. And have a nice week. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Questioning Behaviour. Tune in to our next episode to find out which behaviour we will be questioning next. A podcast is a bit of a one-way medium. We're talking to you, but you can't actually talk back. If you'd like a more interactive exchange, do reach out to us via our socials. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Just look for Questioning Behavior. We're also on Twitter using at QB underscore podcast. We're looking forward to hearing from you. See ya. Bye. <laughs>